My name is Brad Rayfield. I'm one of the orthopedists at SOS. Thanks again for coming out here today. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll make this, this um, talk as informal as I possibly can make it. So I know it's kind of what we're on hour number two now, almost into hour number three. So you're probably starting to fade a little bit. So if you have any questions, just holler, interrupt me at any point, because I can imagine I've sat through many of these lectures before and it, it can get a little bit boring, but um, I want to make it as interactive as possible. So I was kind of tasked originally with the topic of return to play. And, um, you know, it's, we, Amy and I were talking, emailing back and forth. I was trying to think of how I can make this as interesting as possible because return to play is, is so, such a vast topic. Um, you know, we talk in ankle sprains, we talk in shoulder injuries, or we talk in rotator cuff tears or ACL tears. And so what I thought I'd do is kind of break it up into um, a couple different kind of segments. And one is um, return to play for one of the more common and most devastating injuries, which would be an ACL tear, um, which I'm sure no matter what level or team you cover, you're always going to have that um, kid or kids that are going to have that ACL tear. And then the age-old question of when can you get them back to playing. And then after we talk about that, I thought I'd talk a little bit about other kind of biologic um, things that we can do non-operative to um, get people back a little bit earlier. You know, we talk about that in the media all the time, and I thought I'd maybe kind of enlighten um, some of, at least, the, and expose you to some of the orthopedic research, and is any of this true, or is it just all, um, you know, snake oil? So first, you know, as I mentioned, what is return to play? I could talk about, I could sit here for, for a whole weekend talking about return to play for MCL, ACL, ankle sprains, um, tendinopathies, and, you know, we're seeing it more and more, actually, osteoarthritis. And I'm not talking about bone on bone um, arthritis in a, uh, you know, in your grandmother or grandfather. I'm talking about, and even in teenagers or co collegiate or even, you know, especially professional athletes, we're seeing more and more knee arthritis, not necessarily bone on bone knee replacement, but you're starting to see as kids play at an earlier age, they're weightlifting, they're, they're running, jumping, we're seeing a little bit more wear. And so I thought I'd address that a little bit in the future, in the end of the talk, if we have time. So ACL tears, you know, fall sports are starting, soccer, uh, football, you're all going to have knee injuries um, and you're going to see what happens, you know, that, that whole evolution of injury to pre-surgery to surgery to post-operative and then the hardest part is rehab and then getting back to play because that's when, you know, they, when, when can you play? And if you ask 10 different orthopedists, you'll get 10 different answers. So. What I have to really stress to my patients after an ACL tear is, you know, everybody wants to be like Adrian Peterson. You know, he came back eight months later, won the, you know, MVP or most improved player comeback award, you know, every award are man manageable. Um, but for every Adrian Peterson, there's a Derek Rose who took about 14 months to come back only to re-injure his other knee. And then you got the Sam Bradford who comes back in a year after he came back from his ACL re reconstruction, he comes out and tears, in like the second game, his, his re-tears his ACL. So these are all things that people only remember Adrian Peterson, they don't remember the, the uh, not so optimal results. So basically in talking about ACL tears, I know Dr. Narowski t uh, touched upon knee injuries, but I'm just going to kind of briefly talk about this and then we'll get into like the return to play stuff. But basically, we, no matter what the orthopedist says, we are not giving you a stronger ACL than what you had before. We're going to try to get it as close as possible, and that's the key. So the goal is really the, is to prevent a re-tear. That is our goal when we talk about return to play. So this is all um, basically hinges on your post-operative care. And you know perhaps just as important as the surgery, in fact, it's probably more important, is the post-operative rehab. You know, physical therapy, you got to get rid of the pain, the effusion. You want to get your range of motion back and eventually work on strengthening. And your overall rehab time depends on are there injuries to your meniscus, are there other ligamentous injuries, are there other cartilage injuries. I'm not going to get into that, but these are all things to consider when not every ACL return to play is the same. So basically, I don't care what any orthopedist says, there's always a risk of a re-tear. Um, Basically, in the orthopedic literature, we don't like to talk about this a lot in public, but basically in the orthopedic literature, there is a re-injury risk. And the re-injury risk is anywhere from 15 to 30%. That is high. That's almost a third of, of, in some studies. Now, it also shows that the other knee is at risk up to 
in, this, in these same studies. So when people always ask, you know, am I at risk? Yes, you're at risk for re-tearing that ACL, but you're also at risk of, of tearing your other ACL. And that's something that, again, we don't like to maybe talk about or, or, or publicize, but it's something that as trainers, as coaches, you got to take that into consideration that this is all in the back of our head. So maybe it's something that we should start, you know, talking about with our patients and the coaches. So really, there's no prospective study, so we don't know what that magic time frame is to get back to playing. So why do they fail? Well, um, the, there's a higher rate of rupture in people under 25. Well, everyone in this room is probably coaching kids that are under 25. The highest risk of retear are women uh, athletes under the age of 20. Those, those the women teenage athletes, for a variety of reasons that I, we don't really want to get into now, but it involves anatomy and, and um, biomechanics and things like that, those are the highest risk. And high school women, that high school um, female athletes are the highest risk of retear. So a lot of this is, a, is dependent on rehabilitation or um, you know, re-injury. If you're going out to play football, you can get tackled there again. Even though a lot of the injuries are non-contact, many times um, contact sports is, is where you see the higher um, prevalence, especially in the fall sports. So what we know is that that graft, after an ACL reconstruction, takes two years to, to fully heal. We can't do anything as orthopedists to, to speed up that process. So nobody waits two years to get back to play. So what we do is we try to create an environment where the, the, um, the strength around the knee is enough to protect that graft until it fully heals. Um, and we also know that at six months, 90% of patients still have residual weakness, which does put them at risk. So this is kind of like this recipe for disaster when everybody wants to get back at, at six months. So traditionally, you know, the first couple of weeks, you're, you're on crutches after an ACL reconstruction. And then at three months, you start running. And then anywhere from four to six months is when we let everyone go back to playing. Well, then we started seeing this high rate of re-tears. So then we said, well, maybe it's not a cookie cutter tech, you know, protocol. We got to look at other things. And this is when we started looking at um, the muscle imbalance between your quad and your hamstring. Um, we realized that it does take two years for that graft to heal. So now um, you're going to see orthopedists wait a little bit longer. In my practice, I let return. Um, I really don't discuss return to play until at least eight months, but I'm looking at more like a 10 month time frame right now. And a lot of kids aren't, don't like that. You know, they want to get back at six months, but you got to remind them that you do not want to have to go through this again. And a lot of times you're going to see these kids a lot more than we're going to see them. And so you're going to be the ones that are going to get that coach. Can I go play coach? Can I go play? You know, um, the, the trainer on the sideline, when can I play? When can I play? And I think it's really important for you guys to have some of this information so that you can tell them, listen, we don't want, we don't want to lose you after your first game back to another re-injury. So these are all things that, that I, uh, I try to stress to my patients as much as possible. Um, so now when we understand these risks, we can really come up with a better plan of return to play. So I always tell people the quickest way to return to play is to prevent the injury in the first place. And so this brings up um, another topic that I'm actually very interested in and I'm doing um, a lot of my own kind of um, uh, research in is, is ACL prevention programs. And so can we stop ACL injuries? No. There's nothing we can do short of telling a kid not to play sports that we can't stop the risk. But we can try to minimize these injuries. How? Well, um, these are controversial, but, and I don't want to get into them, but there's the two most common ways of preventing are, are ACL braces which you see the NFL players or college players wear the linemen, they wear those braces on their knees. I'm not gonna sit up here and tell you to put braces on your, on your high school kids, but that is something that we can discuss at a later date. Um, and then prevention programs, which actually is something that you can start at the high school level. In fact, we started doing that in some of the schools that we cover. Um, and have we noticed uh, a big difference? Well, it's very difficult to do it on a, on a, on a small population, but you'll, I'll, as I mentioned, as I'll, touch upon in a little bit, if you look at thousands and thousands of kids, yes, these programs do work. So what are these ACL injury prevention programs? Well, it's, it's basically hip and core strengthening. It's a fancy word for hip and core strengthening. And what we do is it involves a warm-up, some stretching, some strengthening, um, plyometrics, some balance training, and then um, some agility drills. And we actually have a couple of these on our website, and I can get them to you. Um, my card's out front. If you um, go to that website, it's rayfieldmd.com, 
We have these. That's R A P H A E L M D dot com. We have these ACL prevention programs, and feel free you can print them out and um, use them at, at your uh, at your respective schools. Um, basically, why are we doing this? Well, the last couple of years there's been a lot of research looking at it, and basically this study from 2012 showed they you know this was out of um, Britain. Great Britain, and where they have more socialized uh, databases, socialized medicine, so they can really track these injuries a lot better than we can. And they, these were looking at um, thousands and thousands of kids, and they showed that this, these, uh, the non-contact injury, you're not going to prevent the kid that gets tackled and the leg gets twisted, but the non-contact, which is the most common injury uh, for ACL, did decrease by about 43% with using these programs. So basically, there is evidence that these, these programs do work. Um, it's very difficult to prove, but at the end of the day, I, as I tell my um, patients as, as they uh, um, want to get back to play, it doesn't hurt. It's a, it's a workout program. You know, you're not losing anything by at least trying to do this hip and core strengthening program, so you really don't have anything to lose. Um, and also, these programs can help treat and prevent other knee injuries like patellofemoral pain. That's that pain in the front of the knee around the kneecap. Uh, tendinopathy like patel tendinitis, quad tendinitis, and other lower b body injuries like ankle sprains and uh, um, and things like that. So, so that's kind of my 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 public service announcement for kind of these prevention programs. Um, now let's kind of talk about how do we speed up return to play. And these are uh, something that kind of got a lot of news lately. I'm, I'm looking at alternative treatment, and uh, I don't know if if anyone saw Michael Phelps with the cupping. Um, you know, that got a lot of press over the last couple of days. Well, this girl looks like she's having way too much fun doing this. But this was, this was actually, I, I, I took this, I think this was on his Twitter account or something. But, you know, people are always looking for anything to give him an edge to get back to playing. And a lot of this is really, what, is, what are these injuries? These are more chronic overuse injuries. And so all these things, whether it's acupuncture, cupping, and that up at the top right, which I'm going to talk about is platelet-rich plasma, these are things that we want to get blood flow, and we want to basically help the body heal this area that does not have a good blood flow or is, is basically suffering from an overuse inflammatory process. So I, I, I thought I'd talk about cupping, but then I realized I know zero about cupping, and I know zero about acupuncture, so I figured I'd stick with the things that I actually know a little bit more about, and that would be platelet-rich plasma. So what are we talking about? Well, on, um, this became very popular last spring. I don't know if you guys, if anyone's an NBA fan, but uh, this is Stephen Curry, and he, in the middle of the uh, beginning of the playoffs, had an MCL sprain, and he missed a couple games, and they made a big deal. He had a couple of injections into his knee with this platelet-rich plasma, and that got him back to playing, um, they claim, much quicker. Um, so what are we talking about? What is platelet-rich plasma? Well, um, the blood has really four components. There's plasma, which is like the fluid that it lives in, there's red blood cells, which gives it its color, white blood cells, which, which treat in, like infection and bacteria, and then you have platelets. Well, platelets are the, the smallest and, the, and the, um, basically the, the, uh, the least amount of, of cells in the, in the blood, but that's what we're going to talk about because they, um, here you can see, I don't know whether you can see, basically platelets and white blood cells represent less than 1% of the blood components. And so, um, these platelets are these small little cells that don't have a nucleus. They, they float around in your body, and then when they get activated, if there's a cut or there's trauma, basically they release these granules and they become these clots. And that's when you cut yourself and you get a scab. That's the platelets basically initiate that, that process. So they circulate in the body for seven to 10 days. They have a very short lifespan and they're very, very small. This is actually an electron microscope, so they're very, you can't see them with the, with the um, human eye, and, and you can barely even see them in a microscope. So um, what is platelet-rich plasma then? So now we know what platelets are. Platelet-rich plasma is basically um, any level of platelets above normal. So that could be twice as many platelets, that could be four times as many platelets, that could be 25 times as many platelets. Platelet-rich plasma just means a higher concentration than the normal body level. So what they've done over the last really 10 to 15 years is dozens and dozens of companies have come out with systems 
to create this platelet-rich plasma, where we take blood from your body, we spin it down, and isolate the platelets. These are basically just four of the most common ones that are out there. Uh, we actually use, uh, in our office setting, the Biomet, which is this one, and the uh, Arthrix, which is this one. But basically, there's a lot of variation, and I'm not even going to get into all this, because again, they have weekend-long seminars in orthopedics for uh, looking at platelet-rich plasma. I'm not going to bore you with all those details. So here, I'm, as I, as you, it's really not as painful as it looks, but um, these are the two different types that we use most common, and you can see it's a simple blood draw. So the nice thing about this is it's not steroids, it's, uh, like a, uh, it's not um, a foreign object. There's no risk of uh, basically a reaction. There's no really risk of any type of allergic reaction or um, anything like that because we're basically taking from your own body. So it's, it's, a, it's a relatively safe um, procedure. And here it is, basically, we draw the blood, uh, collect it in this tube, and you can see here, after we centrifuge it, kind of that first cartoon picture I showed you a couple slides ago, here's a platelet, here's a plasma, here's red blood cells, there's a small level right there, that's the uh, platelets, that, that's, that's what we're going after. So when do we use PRP? Well, it's like uh, orthopedists are like carpenters, and if you give a carpenter a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, if you give an orthopedist a tool like PRP, we start thinking everything can be used for, you know, we look for excuses to use it. So basically, we've used it in everything, and you can find uh, articles in literature from um, tendinopathies, which is Achilles tendinitis, tennis elbow, lateral epicondylitis, plantar fasciitis, partial tendon tears, anything that's a chronic tendinopathy that we want to get patients back quicker, we started using this PRP in, and, and with some success. Then we started looking at acute injuries. All right, that ankle sprain, that MCL sprain that Stephen Curry had, where you know a week is a difference between making the final NBA finals or losing in the conference finals. You know, a week in the NFL is a difference of um, making the playoffs or not for a quarterback or a you know a star running back. So basically, you know, we talk about oh, it's only a difference of a couple days or seven or ten days. Well, when we're talking professional athletes, that's a huge, huge difference. And so. Um, We've, you started using it for everything. And as I mentioned in the beginning, here it comes up again, osteoarthritis, which is perhaps the most encouraging results that we've seen um, for PRP. And uh, so what, what's this tendinopathy that I keep talking about? Well, you know, you're going to see you all have kids that have, or you're taking care of kids that have Achilles tendinitis, patella tendinitis, lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, things that are basically, is it keeping them out of play? not necessarily preventing them from playing, but it's preventing them from getting to that high level that they're, that they're used to. And so what we're talking about is, I don't know if you can tell, but this, you see, this is what a normal tendon looks like. Nice, ordered, layer after layer. This is what a tendonitis or tendinopathy looks like. It's all disordered. And what that is, is it's an area that does not have a good blood supply, and after chronic repetitive motion and re-injury, it just, the body can't heal it. So we're looking for, for ways to enhance the body's, body's ability to heal these things. So um, what do we do? Well, we basically, it's a supply and demand. We want to increase the supply of, of healthy tissue, blood flow, and oxygen to that area. So the PRP is important because it can help get these areas with low blood, felt, but low blood flow and poor cell turnover to enhance the body's ability to heal it. So, as I mentioned, it basically allows the opportunity to, to utilize the body's own growth factors to improve the speed of recovery and return to play. So, I'm, I'm just going to briefly touch upon it. It's not the platelets themselves that are doing the recovery and, and improving the process. It's the growth factors. So, platelets, when they get activated, when you have a blood, when you cut yourself and you have a clot and a scab, it's actually the platelets kind of are the, the conductors and they release the growth factors that basically recruit other growth factors to help the body's ability to heal. And there's a lot of different growth factors out there. You know, these are just some of the ones that, that are mentioned in the literature. But the big thing is, is this insulin-like growth factor. And I don't expect you to remember that, but you may, it may kind of sound familiar for those of you that are NFL fans, because I don't know if you remember when the 
Uh, Ravens played in the Super Bowl about four or five years ago. Ray Lewis got in trouble for using deer antler spray. I don't know if anybody remembers that. And then it was uh, VJ Singh was using it. It was the Alabama football team is using it. Well, that's basically this insulin-like growth factor, but at a super therapeutic levels. And I actually did a little bit of research. What they do is they claim they don't injure the deer, but they harvest baby deer antlers and basically um, use the, uh, the, the fuzz of the deer antlers, have high concentrations of this growth factor. So that's what they've been doing. They spray into the nose. So there's so many different choices. There's, I, you know, I mentioned there's four different types of, of systems that we use. Um, how many platelets? I mentioned that PRP is just a higher than normal level. Well, does that mean we need to have two times, four times, eight times? What's the amount of platelets? And the answer is we don't know. Um, and if we take one of any of your blood now and test it for how many platelets are in that blood versus how many platelets are in that blood after dinner tonight, it will be different. So not only are the systems different, but throughout the day, the cycle of platelets in the body is different. So the answer is, is we don't know. That's the, that's the disadvantage of using the, your own patient's tissue is because it is variable. That's the downside. So there are a lot of obstacles. You know, here I am, I'm talking about all these great things, but there are obstacles. Obstacles being the FDA. The FDA doesn't like you manipulating a lot of these things, which is why a lot of these athletes go to Europe because um, they can do some special manipulations with their blood, not necessarily legal, but um, there's not a lot of research. There is a lot of research, but not a lot of prospective studies because, um, as I mentioned, there's, you know, we don't, there's a lot of different systems. There's a lot of different platelet um, concentrations. We don't know the answer. And financial. Insurance companies deem this experimental. So a lot of times this is not covered by insurance. That puts a lot of responsibility on the patient, on the athlete, and on your, on your players. So um, it's very difficult to kind of have someone spend money for, for an intervention that we don't have a lot of information on. But the interest is there. This was a Google hit for PRP. You can see from 2011 to 2014, you know, it, 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 it magnified by almost six times. So does it work? Well, this is encouraging. Um, we started off with looking at cells in Petri dishes, and we had some good response. Um, this is another study that showed that PRP may result in beneficial effect on target cells when we looked at um, uh, basically tendon and, and, and human bone and muscle. So we extrapolated these, these kind of cellular Petri dishes or um, uh, basically uh, in vitro studies that, okay, let's try it on, on clinical studies and clinical populations. So most of these studies are, are, are low numbers of patients and they're, we call them case studies where it's basically, I can tell you about my experience in it. We don't have a lot of like big studies with hundreds and hundreds of people in it, but uh, they've shown mixed results. We have a great study that showed increased reco recovery from hamstring injury. In, in my practice, I've seen a lot of good um, progress with hamstring injuries. That's one that we traditionally had used up at the university and you get a one or two weeks quicker from a hamstring injury and that's the difference between you know a third or a quarter of uh, a football season. Um, you know but in some animal studies we didn't see a lot of difference. Um, but one of the more encouraging things lately actually even Rochester has done a lot of research in this um, at University of Rochester ankle sprains. Ankle sprains have shown a lot of good um, studies for uh, platelet-rich plasma in improving our quicker return to play. So this is what I kind of touched on earlier, and I'll, I'll end with these last couple slides. Um, I think that the most encouraging results have been in the, in the field of, of arthritis. And again, I'm not talking about bone on bone. Grandma or grandpa needs a new knee replacement. This is early cartilage wear that we're seeing at a younger and younger age, uh, where the cartilage is seeing both little pothole defects or just thinning of the cartilage. And these are studies that looked at comparing platelet-rich plasma to some of the other things that we've uh, traditionally used, such as um, visco supplementation, which is like a lubrication. And we've had really, really good uh, preliminary um, results. And so this is what I really see the, the, the biggest um, future in this platelet-rich plasma. Um, and again, we don't know if it's because the platelets, when they get injected into the knee or the shoulder, can actually become a scaffold for cartilage to heal around it, or um, it basically just alleviates pain. We're not quite sure yet, but it's very encouraging. Um, is it kosher? Well, it is legal in the NCAA, NBA, NFL, 
WNBA, and all, all, these, all the professional leagues. Um, because in 2009, the World Anti-Doping Agency basically said that, you know, if it's deemed medically necessary, they will give you an exemption. Um, basically, you just need a doctor's note. Because that the PRP, as opposed to the deer antler spray, these are really not super therapeutic. Um, so they, you, it doesn't have that anabolic muscular effects. So in conclusion, um, PRP is just any type of higher concentration of platelets. And while they're um, mixed results, at the end of the day, um, it is encouraging because you don't really have a lot to lose. It is your own tissue, so there's not a lot of side effects, or if any. And we have really encouraging results in um, uh, return to play for certain, um, certain uh, um, pathologies. But the biggest thing is patient selection. I mean, said that, any questions? Right. Yes. Yes, actually, so the question, I don't know if everybody heard, is stem cell. Um, this is actually something that's really, really, I think is exciting and, and something interesting that I've been um, really interested in, um, stem cells. Basically, people looked at PRP and they said, okay, we've got a lot of growth factors. And actually, in addition to growth factors, it may recruit stem cells that are circling around. Everybody has stem cells that are circulating in their body. Additionally, there are certain parts of your body that has even more stem cells, such as bone, especially in your pelvis bone. So um, what people started looking at is, okay, well, let's kind of, PRP is great, platelet-rich plasma is great, but let's even magnify that thousands of times by looking at stem cells. And so what we started doing is taking stem cells from your iliac crest. Well, they try to do it just from your, your blood, but at the end of the day, we just don't have enough circulating that we can concentrate it to any clinically significant amount. So they started taking it from uh, your hip. But this is more of an invasive procedure where you have to go into the operating room. We can't do this in the office. It's not a simple blood draw. But you take it out of the hip, and you can isolate stem cells. Um, and you inject those stem cells into one of these muscle injuries or arthritis or you know, early arthritis, and we've seen great results. But those, as, as small as the, result, as the studies are for platelet-rich plasma, the stem cell studies are even smaller. But it's very, very encouraging. Um, not a lot of places do it. New York State did not allow it for a while. So I had a couple patients that were interested in it. They had to go to New Jersey. Um, we have started investigating doing that here in Syracuse, and that's something to look for in the future. But again, it's a lot more invasive. Uh, you can't just go into the office. You have to actually, it requires sedation in the operating room. Um, and it's very expensive because that is not covered by insurance. So you're looking at, instead of a couple hundred dollars, you're looking at a couple thousand dollars for some of those procedures. Um, so stay tuned. But good, good question. All right, anybody else? Yes. So that's the, the million dollar question, is how many injections? Um, you know, just like anything else, more is thought to be better. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the um, studies have, have promoted three injections. You know, one a week for three weeks, basically to kind of stimulate that, that healing process, which is great if you're not paying for the injection. But we're talking of, of, of not high level NFL athletes, or you know, athletes that we treat up at SU, we're talking about high school kids or you know, weekend warriors. So in my practice, I've, I usually, if we do it, we start with one or two. Um, I've had a couple patients that have, had gone on, that have gone on to have three, um, but the answer is we don't know the optimal amount. We know that three is better than one, but how much more benefit are you getting that you can justify having that patient pay you know, a couple hundred dollars more? I know that there's a, a group in Rochester that does, it gives you like a special, if you buy three, they cut the price down a little bit. So we haven't done that here because it's a tough time justifying it. And, um, but uh, the answer is probably more is better, but we don't know it enough to really promote that. So usually we start off with one. Anything else? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.